Good morning. My name is Rory. I'm one of the pastors here at the Springs Church. Everybody say hi, Rory. Hi, Rory. Hey, and if you're watching us on YouTube, just the YouTube people, say hi, Rory. <laughs> you got to wonder if anybody did. <laughs> Good to see you all here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We're in a series called Happy New, New Year, New You, and we're going to talk about uh, something important today, uh, a number of things, uh, prayer and fasting. Today, we're going to start off with fasting because we are starting a, a, uh, a three-week fast here at the Springs Church starting today, uh, kind of as a corporate group, and uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Traditionally, uh, fasting is abstaining from some sort of food uh, or drink as a spiritual discipline, but uh, today it can also mean abstaining from something else, uh, not just food and drink, as a spiritual discipline. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, fasting was, was very common. It was expected. Uh, Moses, uh, twice in the Bible, was known to do 40 days of fasting. Uh, Jesus did 40 days of fasting. And uh, when he spoke to his followers, he said, uh, when you fast, uh, and then he continued to speak. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, the, the, the sentence started out as when you fast, not if you fast, but when you fast. It was taken for granted that people would fast in those days. It's mentioned 75 times in the Bible. It's a biblical way to humble yourself before God. It can transform your prayer life into a, a richer, more personal experience. And so if you want to take your worship and prayer life to the next step, you might want to join us for the next 21 days on a fast <coughs> here. 21 days without food. I'll die. Look, we, we want you to go to God. We don't want you to go next month. <laughs> so um, we, we want you to get closer to God, but not, not, we don't want you to die. Uh, obviously, we don't want you to get sick. So there are reasons not to do a food fast, and let me just run through some of them. If you are physically too thin, uh, if you're prone to anorexia, bulimia, or suffer weakness or anemia, or have tumors, bleeding ulcers, cancer, blood diseases, or heart disease, I sound like one of those ads on TV, don't I? One of those medicine ads. <clears throat> yes, if you suffer chronic problems with kidneys, liver, lungs, hearts, or other important organs, if you take insulin for diabetes or suffer from any other blood sugar problems such as hypo hyperglycemia, if you are pregnant or nursing, do not do a food fast. <laughs> but this shouldn't stop you from fasting because it's not just food that we can fast from. We can uh, fast from other things. The idea is to give up whatever it is that you turn to comfort instead of God yeah. and to concentrate on God, it might be food. You might want to do a food fast this week. Now, you don't have to give up all food. You could give up uh, two meals a day and eat one meal. You could give up one meal a day. And not just, it's, me, it's easy because I never eat breakfast anyway. So, like, yo, I'll just skip breakfast. I'm good, God. Yeah. No. <laughs> doesn't work like that. You have to give up something that you normally have, the idea. It could be just desserts. Maybe you're going to give up desserts for three weeks or snack foods for three weeks or uh, soda pop, soft drinks. Give those up for three weeks. See how, how you deal with that. Caffeine. Mm-hmm. TV. Oh, I'm hitting where it hurts now. Video games. Kids. Yeah. Internet. Could you live without internet for three weeks? Facebook or Twitter. Cigarettes. I know, I know, it's asking too much, but here's the point. You want to give up something that is important to you. When I was young, man, uh, I turned to movies for solace. When I was having a rough time in my life, and I was for a while, I would go to the movies and lose myself in the movies. I, did, I went to the movies practically every day. I saw every movie ever made during the, the, the 1980s. Um, and I mean that almost literally, every movie they ever made, because uh, I went every day, I'd see two or three movies a day to get myself lost in the movies, because I was turning to movies, I was trying to forget my problems instead of, instead of turning to something that was much more important, because I was not a Christian in those days, I did not have God in my life. But the idea here is that what I should have done was turn to God during that time. Um, the idea is instead of looking for comfort by pretending problems don't exist or being distracted from them, you bring them to the one who understands what you're going through and who loves you dearly. So we replace that other hunger for a hunger for God. And the idea is not to suffer. The idea is to be sacrificial, though. So you don't just give up Facebook and then instead fill that time by going to watch TV. That's not the idea. You don't, you don't, <laughs> you don't go to a restaurant and watch everybody else eat and sit there like this. That's not the idea. 
When you give it up, you go and do something else that focuses on God. So if you're going to give up, if, you watch on, if you're on Facebook for an hour every evening, then instead of going on Facebook for that hour, take that hour and go into a room and read the Bible and pray, talk to God, spend time with God. You get the idea how it works? All right. Um, it's not just denying yourself food. It's an exchange for that physical hunger for the needs of the Spirit. Replacing those physical or psychological needs with prayer, reading God's words, uh, this is essential if you're going to bring your fast to, to completion because if you dissipate your energy on numerous uh, busybody things to do and projects, uh, errands and stuff, and you neglect spending the time with God, then you're going to fail your fast. You're going to starve both physically and spiritually. And you find yourself becoming discouraged and frustrated instead of benefited. The more time you spend with God in fellowship and prayer and adoration and worship, the more meaningful your fast will be. Now, in the Bible, um, Jesus said to us, and it's in Matthew 6, He said, be careful when you do good things. Don't do them in front of people to be seen by them. If you do that, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Later on, He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand in front of the synagogues and the street corners and pray so people will see them. I tell you the truth, they've already had their full reward. When you pray, you should go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who cannot be seen. Your Father can see what's done in secret, and He will reward you. And later on, He says, when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They're making their faces look sad to show people they're fasting. I tell you the truth, those hypocrites already have their full reward. So when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, and people will not know that you're fasting, but your Father, whom you cannot see, will see you. Your Father sees what's done in secret, and He will reward you. So a lot of people take those three passages in the Bible in order to mean don't tell anybody you're fasting. All right, let me straighten that out for you right now. They want to avoid the, the, the sin of the Pharisees, and that's, that's good to want to avoid those things, but, but it's okay to share that you're fasting with other people. It's okay to share whenever you are doing something to get you closer to God. It's okay to share that. It's okay to say, oh, no, oh, what are you reading? I'm reading the Bible. Uh, can you go out with us on Sunday? I, I go to church on Sundays. It's okay to share the things that you do. You're not having lunch with us today? No, I'm fasting. I'm trying to get closer to God. Because that's what inspires other people sometimes. By isolating ourselves from the support of other Christians, we're also susceptible to doubts and negative influences. We need this prayer shield of other people to come around us to help us get through this thing. Otherwise, when we were alone and we're feeling weak and the enemy is coming at us, then we, then we fail. Mm -hmm. Besides that, if you share that you're fasting with your spouse or your friends and that chocolate chip cheesecake comes around, uh, they can say, uh, <clears throat> I believe you're in a fast, <laughs> which is helpful. And then you go off and you say, God, I really wanted that cheesecake. Oh, why am I doing this? And he says, back to you. Because you're talking to me now, aren't you? <laughs> so why are you doing this? What's the result of fasting? Well, usually it's a renewed closeness to God, a greater sensitivity to spiritual things. But look, uh, don't be disappointed if you don't have a mountaintop experience. A lot of people, when they do a fast, they, they report that they got closer to God than ever before, and that's great. But other people who have honestly made the effort come back and said it didn't particularly affect them at all. For them, it was physically, emotionally, spiritually draining. But they knew they'd been called to God for fast, and they did it as an act of worship because He has affects these things. And God, God rewards that kind of behavior. Your motive in fasting should be to glorify God, not to have an emotional experience, not to attain personal enlightenment or happiness, and certainly not to show off. But when your motives are right, God will honor your seeking heart and bless your time with Him in a very special way. So try it. Now, this is a time of prayer and fasting, so now we're going to talk about prayer. And uh, we have kids in today. It's, it's always nice uh, when the kids stop in. We do this several times a year, and uh, when we do that, I like to do something a little different than normal. And so... Uh, I'm going to bring my, my friend out here. 
my friend uh, Manti. Hello. Hola. How are you today? Oh, not so good. Something bugging you? <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Seriously, you okay? Well, I don't know how to pray. Uh, gee, that's a problem because I'm a praying mantis. <laughs> yeah, that could be a problem. What's holding you back? Well, first, I can't kneel. I got bad knees. Uh, you know, you don't have to kneel to pray. Really? Yeah. Okay. And uh, look at my eyes. You have beautiful eyes. Thank you, but I don't have any eyelids. I can't close my eyes. I see. Me too. All the time. Uh, you don't have to shut your eyes to pray. No? No. You can pray with your eyes open. They all shut their eyes. Except for him. <laughs> it's not required. <laughs> I also feel selfish asking for things. God, give me this. God, give me that. Give me her. <laughs> her? I want a girlfriend. You want a girlfriend, yeah? Why? To get married and have children. Uh, no, I don't think you want that. Oh, I do, I do. <laughs> See, I practice for the wedding. I do, I do. <laughs> Manny, you know that uh, after mating, the female uh, praying mantis uh, kills the male. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. He bites his head right off and then he eats him. You know? It might be worth it. It's not worth it. <laughs> Point is, you don't have to ask for things when praying. Instead, you can thank God for what you've got. You can just talk to Him. Tell Him how much you appreciate Him, how much you love Him. And you don't have to go to church to do it. You can do it anywhere. You can do it driving in a car. I don't have a car. I'm an insect. Right. You're a praying mantis. Well, a mantis anyway. <sighs> All right. I'll tell you what. I will teach you to pray. You're an expert? Yes, I'm an expert. Uh, I learn from the best. Pastor Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Better than Pastor Brian, the boss. Ashley. <laughs> oh, no, no. no, 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 no. No, no, no. No, no, no. The big man. Rick Warren? No, Jesus, Jesus. Talking about Jesus. Jesus taught us to pray. It's in the Bible. It's in Luke. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and uh, when he was finished, one of the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And so Jesus did. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Would you like to learn it? We'll see. Okay. Repeat after me. Our Father, dear Father, no, 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 our Father. See, that's different. See, Jesus rated this very, very carefully. He didn't say just uh, dear Father or my Father. He said our Father. That's a very inclusive thing. That means that it's, it's all of us, our Father. That means we are all brothers and sisters with the same Father. Oh. Our Tata. <laughs> Who art in heaven. Is that his name? What? Art. No. <laughs> No. Is he a painter? Is he a painter? Well, actually, have you ever seen a sunset? Yeah. Well, he's a fantastic painter. But uh, that's not what it refers to. Who art in heaven is the old-fashioned way of saying who is in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That's his name. Harold. Not Harold. Hallowed. Hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. It means holy be your name. See, the name of anything is the essence, the essential nature or character of that thing. And what is the word that best describes God? Holy. Right. Holy. Hallowed. Hallowed is thy name. Hallowed is thy name. Yes, it could be worded, may your name always be holy. Got it. All right, you ready? We go on. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. This means that we're supposed to be trying our best to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. How? <gasps> Revolution! <laughs> no, no. Simply by doing things His way. Most of us spend our lives trying to expand our own little personal kingdoms, our own little assets and resources and influence, but God tells us that we need to live in His kingdom to surrender our values, to embrace His, turn over our will to His, turn over our ambition to His ambition. Your kingdom come doesn't just mean invite the Father to look over us. It means invite Him to rule over us. Not just a partner in our lives, but to take charge of our lives. We shouldn't ask, which kingdom are we seeking? Ours or His? You can't, can't have both. You've got to ask that. Maybe it should go, your kingdom come, our kingdom done. That's good. Yeah. And to me, this kingdom on earth is, that is on earth as it is in heaven thing doesn't get enough attention. Because I think that sometimes people worry too much about what happens when they die. I think that people use Christianity as, as sort of a, 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 an insurance policy. They pay by saying, I believe in Jesus, and then they go to church every now and then, and they think, that's it, they can go to heaven then. But uh, that's not how it works. It takes away the importance of thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, on earth now, here, his will be done. This calls for a lot more than just believing. It calls for action. Being a Christian is not a spectator sport. We're going to make this life on earth, anything like that is heaven. It's going to take a lot of effort. How do we do that? That sounds like a huge job. Yes, it does seem overwhelming. But it starts with each one of us supporting our church, serving at our church, that's a good start. Supporting a charity, serving at a charity, that's a good start. Putting our time and our money where our mouth is, so to speak. If the millions of Christians all around the world all got together and decided to make earth be like heaven, ah, oh, wouldn't it be incredible? And the way I figure it, I'm not in charge of all the other Christians in the world, but I am in charge of me. So I need to do that. Well, how can I help? Well, actually, you're helping right now. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. What's... Uh, uh, next in the prayer, let's see. Uh, ah, give us our day, our daily bread. Give us today a loaf of bread. <laughs> not a loaf of bread. Our daily bread. It's symbolic. It means not only food, but shelter and clothing, the things that we need to help us live. A giant tree to live in. The biggest tree in all the woods. And all the other creatures will say, oh. Look at that tree. What a great tree. He has a great tree. No, that's not the point. You're missing the point. It's not about what we want. It's about what we need. Wants and needs are two very different things. And it could also mean giving us knowledge, giving us understanding of God, an ongoing every, uh, everyday relationship with Him. This feeds us spiritually. We get this by reading the Bible, coming to church, listening to the lessons, praying, anything else? Well, sure. Now that we're talking about uh, things that we need, we could also talk about our daily relationship uh, with people, too. Got to have a relationship with people. We were not designed to be alone. We were designed with connection with others. Solitary confinement is a cruel punishment. Loneliness could be debilitating. We need other people in our lives to fill our souls. We need as, as much as we need uh, food to nourish our bodies. That's why we encourage people to get into life groups at our church. Yeah. Not just to hang out and have fun. Well, hanging out and fun, that's a good thing. Uplifts the soul, it's affirming, it's great. But life groups also share in the hard times, the difficult times. Oh, like when Naya and Eagles came around, when my uncle died, 
Oh, your uncle died? Yeah. Right after he got married. <laughs> hey! Never mind. It might have been worth it. Yeah, okay. It wasn't worth it. <laughs> Let's just move on. Where were we? Give us this day our daily bread. Ah, yes. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Like coming into my tree. The sign says, no trespassing. No, it's not that kind of trespassing. Another way of putting it is uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. Are there no Christian bankers? Well, it's not that kind of debt. It doesn't mean money. Another way of putting it is forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Oh. <gasps> oh. What? Well, I like that forgive me my sins part, but uh, it sounds to me like in the second half of that, Jesus is saying, I have to forgive too. Yep. That's, that's absolutely. It says, as we forgive those who sin against us. Oh, boy. That's not easy. No, it's not. And on top of that, he makes it so that we are asking people to forgive us on the same level that we forgive them. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. In the same way that I want to be totally forgiven. If you want to be totally forgiven, then you need to totally forgive everyone that you're holding something against. Every individual, every body of people, every nation, every political party, every race, every social class, every religious group you may not approve of. Whoa, this is harder than I thought. Yeah, much harder than most people think about. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, how dare we beg for grace and no intention of extending it to someone else? How impudent of us to plead for forgiveness while harboring bitter bitterness and resentment against others. Christ knows that guilt eats at us both directions. Our own guilt burdens us, but so does the relentless condemnation that we cast upon others. Both scenarios destroy us. This is serious stuff. Yep, sure is. A lot of people say that line in that prayer and they don't even think about what they're saying. But if you can't say that, this might not be the prayer for you. No, no, no. I like it. It makes me think. And it makes me change. Mm -hmm. That's good. You ready to continue? See? All right. Lead us not into temptation. Why would he? Why would God lead us into temptation? Well, he wouldn't. So why is it there? And that is a good question. I had to think about that a lot. You want to know the answer I came up with? See? All right. I think it has to do with maybe a little bit with the level of sp spiritual maturity that we are at. When we first start out, we are easily tempted by all things. We're tempted by this, that, everything that comes along. And, and we get more spiritually mature, and then we're not tempted so much. But there's one temptation that just might tempt us more once we get spiritually mature than others, than, than we had before it. And it, that is the temptation to judge others, to look down on people who aren't as spiritually mature as we are. Oh superiority and self-righteousness. Yep, pride and judgment. We got to watch out for those things. So when we say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we're asking God to save ourselves from our own sinful nature. Evil. Yes. Look, society throws a lot of dark things at us. Uh, anger, lust, jealousy, greed, pride. Aggression, bitterness, indifference. And we're not that strong that we can resist those things just on our own free willpower. So it helps us that we have somebody that's stronger that we can turn to. Tap into that strength, a strength well beyond our own. God, yes, the God of angel armies. Yes, that is very strong. Yes, it is. 
through God that we can transform our hearts, our entire bodies into a temple that evil just doesn't feel comfortable coming inside. Like a vampire can't go into a church. No, not like that. <laughs> I mean, yes, like that, but, but there's no such thing as vampires. Evil, on the other hand, is very, very real. Evil. Like biting the head off you just after. Never mind. <laughs> just saying. All right, the prayer finishes up with, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Thine? Thine. It means uh, yours. Like thy means your, thine means yours. Why don't they just say that? Yours is the kingdom. It's perfectly okay to say it that way. Uh, it makes sense to most of us. You know, for some reason, most of us seem to have uh, learned the Lord's Prayer in the King James Version, and that seems to be the way we say it. Uh, but saying a prayer in a fancy manner uh, or an old-fashioned way uh, doesn't make it more proper or more powerful. Saying it from the heart, speaking how you really feel normally every day, that's more meaningful. The point is yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, not mine. We have to give up our own pursuit of glory and power in order to really get the true blessings of God. Mm -hmm. um, about this kingdom thing, now, we live in a democracy. We do live in a democracy, although these days more and more I'm beginning to think we live in a hypocrisy, but never mind. I get your point. The word kingdom, however, in this case, refers to the dominion of the king of kings, Jesus. Yes, this prayer of the kingdom represents the entire world. Everything is all his creation. God is the king and the power comes from him and he should get full credit. Glory. Yes, the glory for all that's good in this world. That's why we worship him. And you know what's kind of cool about Jesus being the king of kings? What? That makes us, his children, princes and princesses. <gasps> oh, Prince Nanty. He's royal Nantis. I like that. Yeah, I'll bet you do. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Forever and ever. I know what that means. That means... Uh, Always, until the day I die. No, no, it's even beyond that. If we follow Christ as our Lord and Savior, even after we die and leave this world, we will continue to live forever. That's amazing. Yes, it is. And we close the prayer by saying, Amen. The end. Nope. Nope. Not the end. Amen. It's different. It's different. See, the end means it's... It's over. That's just a sign-off, the end. But amen, amen's part of the prayer. Prayer is actually an important part. It, it, it's not just the last line. It's not just a sign-off. It, it's a statement because it means so be it. So be it. It's like saying, I'm serious about this. I really mean it. Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Amen. Amen. So be it. Mm-hmm. Gee, I didn't know that. Now you know. I didn't know how to pray. Now I know. That's nice. You're welcome. But here's the thing, Mandy. Jesus taught us this prayer. He said, this is how to pray. He did not say, this is what to pray. In other words, he said, pray this way, not pray these words. Some people think you need to use those exact same words uh, in order to do a prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. They memorize it and they just say it by rote. They uh, say it or write it. Right, what? You said wrote. No, wrote. Wrote means repeating words without really thinking about them. Our Father. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da
they're not thinking about what the words are. God does not want us to do that. He always wants us to think about what we're praying when we pray it, not just chant phrases. So this is an example of a prayer of how to pray, but it's not necessarily the thing you must pray. Well, is that it? Yeah, it covers all the, all the points. So it's good. Um, here's what we need to do when we pray. I was just this talking about how to pray. It goes like this. First of all, we praise God. We acknowledge that He is the leader of our lives. We ask His provision for our needs and on His help to resist evil. We ask for forgiveness and promise to forgive others. We turn our lives over to Him. Is that enough? Sure, it's enough, but it's not necessarily all. There's a lot of different kinds of prayers. You want, to, you want to hear some others? Oh, yes. All right. I used to do a lot of drama in church. Drama, you know, theatrical things, acting on stage, you know, using puppets and stuff. You don't do that anymore? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> but when I did, here's a prayer I used to say, and I share it, share it often with my fellow performers. It's a, it's a classic prayer. It's the actor's prayer. It goes like this. Dear Father in heaven, I place myself under your protection. Bless me in the studies of the drama. Teach me how to act well my parts. Bearing your presence so within myself that through the perfection of my performances, you may reach beyond the footlights to touch the sensitive, restless hearts of your creatures. God, help me through the drama of life. Guide me and inspire me, and through the beauty of the drama and through the power of acting, I may elevate the thoughts and feelings of those who love and watch it. Dear Father, coach my every drama so that I may fulfill the obligation of leading my friends and spectators to the love and beauty of the divine creator of all drama. And Holy Father, guide me, protect me, and help me on the stage of life. And I pray, take me to you when at last I have taken my final bow on this earth and the drama of life is ending. Amen. Oh, I like that. I think I could do drama in church. You do? Yeah. Here's a very famous one. It's by St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant me that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Wow. That's very good. <laughs> yes, he was a, a good writer. Uh, here's a very famous prayer, prayer that have helped many, many people in their lives. Some of you may be familiar with this. It's, it's by a guy called Reinhold Neighbor, and it's the prayer of serenity. It was like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to thing, change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, Accepting hardships as the pathway, pathway to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and the next. Awesome. It is, isn't it? Here's a prayer I found on the internet. Heavenly Father, help us remember that the jerk who cut us off in traffic last night is a single mother who worked nine hours that day and is rushing home to cook supper, help with homework, do the laundry, and spend a few precious moments with her children. Help us to remember that that pierced, tattooed, disinterested young man who can't make change correctly is a worried 19-year-old college student balancing his apprehension over final exams with his fear of not getting his student loans the next semester. Remind us, Lord, that that scary-looking bum begging for money in the same spot every day who really should get a job is a slave to addictions that we can only imagine in our worst nightmares. 
Help us to remember that the old couple walking annoyingly slow through the store aisles and blocking our shopping progress are savoring this moment, knowing that based on the biopsy report she got back last week, it will be the last year they go shopping together. Heavenly Father, remind us each day that of all the gifts you give us, the greatest gift is love. It is not enough to share that love with those we hold dear, open our hearts, not just to those who are close to us, but to all of humanity. Let us be slow to judge and quick to forgive. Show patience, empathy, and love. Oh, hey, who says there's nothing good on the internet? <laughs> it's not always easy to find, but it's there. You know the name of our church? The Strings. That's right. Spring in the desert is called an oasis. That's right. A life-saving place in a harsh environment like our church. That's right. The water image inspired me to write a poem, a uh, prayer. Prayer in a poetic form. You want to hear it? Yes. Somehow I knew he'd say that. <laughs> God, water is one of your greatest creations. Unique to this wondrous planet you created. Physically, I am 60% water. Let me be like water spiritually as well, as powerful as a tidal wave, as hard to hold back as a rushing river, as happy as a bubbling stream, as cool as a mountain lake, as warm as a bathtub, as beautiful as white fluffy clouds, as refreshing as a needed rain, as soft and as fun to play with as snow, as calm as a still pond, as deep as the ocean, as ice can soothe a physical injury, let me ease the pain of those whose hearts are strained. As hot steam can run a mighty locomotive, let my burning faith send others on their way to you. As it takes millions of drops to form a rainbow, remind me that it takes countless people in many colors to make this world a beautiful place. Let me be like water, God, refreshing those thirsty for you, bringing life to those lost in a spiritual desert. I like that. Oh, but I can't write a prayer like that. Well, you can write a prayer like that. Believe me, I can't do it without you. You are my right hand when it comes to... But never mind. Okay. So I hope you can see that prayer comes in many forms. Prayers don't have to be fancy like this, though. Like the beginning of all of this, we said sometimes, sometimes you just want to talk to God. Tell him how your day's going. Share your feelings. He is the best listener ever. <laughs> and if you listen, you'll realize he has something to tell you too. Oh, I never hear him talk to me like in that movie. Moses. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not quite like that. No, you have to be quiet. You have to listen very carefully. God speaks to us like nobody else does. He, he speaks to us uh, in our minds, in our hearts, in our feelings. Oh, that is not normal. <laughs> no, it's not. But God's not normal. Uh, you know what? I don't want him to be. He's God. Me too. Yeah. Wow. Well, it sure was nice that you took the time to teach me all this. Gracias. You're welcome. De nada. My pleasure. Come here. What? Oh. Now that I know how to pray, I'm going to do it all the time. Amen. Oh, yeah. I'm serious about this. Yes, indeed. I really mean it. So be it. Let's, amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise your name. You are an awesome God. We ask that you help us walk on a path that Jesus showed us to act in the manner that he taught and help change the world for the better. We ask you to provide us the things we need to sustain us, food and shelter and good health and relationships with people and you, have, and you every day. We ask you to forgive us, Father as we in turn forgive everybody that we're holding something against. We ask you to overlook our faults 
as we are well aware that we all fall short of your expectations. And help us, Father, overlook each other's faults, realizing that none of us are perfect and we all struggle. Help us to avoid being attracted to the things that harm us. Give us strength to walk away from them. Protect us from wickedness, for the truth be told, it is every bit as real as goodness. You, dear Father, are the leader of our lives. You have the strength to protect us. For this we worship you and will do so as long as we live and beyond. So be it. Hey, I recognize that. That was the Lord's prayer. Yes, it was. I just said it in a modern way. So as I said before, I hope you can see that prayers all come in different forms, or all different forms. They don't have to be fancy, but they do have to be sincere. See you later. Bye. Adios. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you've heard heard the lessons in church, and you maybe read your Bible, and you think you're ready to make a commitment towards walking in the walk that Christ taught, following His lessons, and telling Him might be the most important prayer that you could say today. So I urge you, if you're at that point, call out to Him with your heart. Tell Him you're tired of doing life your way, the way of the world, and you want to commit to doing life His way. Ask for forgiveness, and He will forgive it. If I invite him in, he will fill your emptiness. Trust in him, and he will lead you in the right direction. Believe in him, because he believes in you. Now, sometimes you just want to pray alone, but sometimes you want to pray with other people. So we have a prayer team that's going to come down here right now. They're going to walk down here, and if you have something going on in your life that you'd like to share with somebody else and pray together and get that power of prayer of corporate prayer, more people. Come on down right after we finish here and, and pray with these people. And if you have prayers, of, like uh, Adam said earlier, if you want to write some prayers down or people that you know that are going through some things, put them on a card and drop them in the black box back there and an entire team of people will pray for them. And I sincerely hope that you will all find the time to focus on God over the next three weeks. Give up something. And when, Whenever you want that thing, take that time, that moment, to think about God. Feed that hunger, that, that physical wanting hunger that you have, and feed your spirit instead. And Happy New Year, and Happy New You. We'll see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks.